Hi. Last time I considered the problem uh, of two liquids mixed together and we found the final temperature of the mixture of two different liquids. And uh, one student asked me, what about three liquids? How should we solve this problem if we have three liquids? So the answer, well, is simple, though the equation which I used last time is not suitable for such a, a three liquid mixture. Last time, I based my solution on this equation, where delta Q1 is the amount of heat energy lost by the first liquid. And this is the amount of heat energy acquired or absorbed by the second liquid. Yes, uh, these two uh, amounts of heat energy must be equal if the container, if the vessel containing the both liquids has adiabatic walls, that is, thick walls which are impermeable to heat. If we have three different liquids, poured into this vessel and mixed together, such liquids that the first liquid had mass M1 and temperature T1 and uh, specific heat C1, and the second liquid M2, T2, C2, etc. There may be three, four, or five, uh, as many liquids as you like. All liquids have different masses and different temperatures. It's me, it means that when we mix these mi uh, liquids together in the same vessel, the temperatures finally will, will become the same, the same. All the temperatures of every liquid will become the same temperature of the mixture. So the final temperature will differ from T1 and differ from T2, etc. In general case, the final temperature will be different. So. Uh, every liquid will either increase its temperature and warm up, or it will decrease its temperature and cool down. Either the temperature will grow or the temperature will be decreased. It means that each liquid will either absorb some heat energy or release some heat energy. But the total balance of all the heat energies must be zero inside this container. It means that the heat energy, either absorbed or released by the first liquid, plus the heat energy, again, uh, absorbed or released by the second liquid, plus the heat energy changed, containing, contained in the third liquid, etc., must be zero. The sum of all changes of heat energies must be zero. That is the uh, energy balance equation for such a uh, mixture of three or more liquids. What is delta Q1? That is the heat capacity of the first liquid times mass of the first liquid times final temperature minus initial temperature of the first liquid. What is delta Q2? It's the heat capacity of the second liquid and the mass of the second liquid times change of temperature, final temperature minus initial temperature for the second liquid, and the same term related to uh, the last liquid number three. Final temperature minus initial temperature of liquid number three. And all this should be zero. Such is the energy balance equation for the mixture of three liquids. Everything is known here, actually, uh, heat capacity of each liquid and the initial mass of each liquid in the which we allow to be mixed in the container. And the initial temperature, T1 and T2 and T3 of each liquid, everything is known. But for the unknown final temperature, which we must find from this equation, and from this equation, we immediately find the final temperature, it will be C1, M1, T2, because I will transfer this term to another side of the equation that will be 
C1, M1, T1, plus with this plus sign C2, M2, T2, plus C3, M3, T3, and divide it by the sum of the coefficients, uh, which are found at as the S coefficients uh, at the final temperature. That is C1, M1, plus C2, M2, plus C3, M3. That is the same formula, actually the same formula that we obtained last time. But this time, I started my derivation from the energy balance equation written in such a form, which is um, a general general form. I don't know beforehand which quantity will be positive and which quantity will be negative, uh, which liquid will lose heat energy or which liquid will obtain or absorb heat energy. I don't know beforehand. Some of these uh, terms here will be positive, but at least one term will be negative, so that uh, so that the sum of these quantities will be zero. Why should it be zero? Because the container for the mixture of many liquids uh, has heat impermeable walls so that heat cannot be absorbed, cannot come here from the external bodies, and also no heat is lost from this container to external bodies. The, heat, the amount of heat energy inside is constant. It's not changed because the walls are thick and heat insulating, impermeable to heat. That is why the amount of heat, total heat energy inside is constant. And if the amount of total heat energy is constant, what is the total heat energy? Well, if the total heat energy is constant, then the change in heat energy, total change in heat energy is zero. That is what is written here. That is the law of conservation of energy for a heat insulated system. That is the closed system, which cannot exchange the heat energy with the outside world. That is, uh, obviously, you can add here many other terms corresponding to other liquids if, if you have more than three liquids. And the final answer will be the same. Here you will have some probably additional terms corresponding to other types of liquids liquid number four, liquid number five, et cetera, et cetera. So this formula will hold for any number of liquids mixed uh, together in a single uh, adiabatic container. So that's the way we consider the mixture of several liquids. And now I would like to solve some other problems. Like problem number 337. Mm -hmm. uh, problem number 337. It says a closed vessel impermeable to heat contains ox uh, ozone it contains ozone it's such a chemical formula three atoms of oxygen uh, making one molecule of ozone at a temperature temperature T1 equal to 527 degrees Celsius after some time, the ozone is completely converted into oxygen. So the ozone is completely converted into oxygen. This process goes on by itself without any interference. Find the increase of the pressure in the vessel if uh, if we know the specific heat 
which is needed to form one gram molecule of ozone from oxygen. So the specific heat of this transfer from ozone to oxygen is 34,000 calories per mole and Kelvin. Uh, no, the, no, you don't need Kelvins here. It's just a specific heat of transfer from one substance to another substance, which goes on at the same temperature. It's possible to, uh, it, it can go on at the same temperature. So the temperature uh, may not necessarily change. It's possible to arrange this process at, at constant temperature. So uh, this is just a specific heat. Th that is the amount of heat released in this process when ozone is transformed into oxygen by itself. In this reaction, this is a chemical reaction actually, uh, because one chemical molecule turns into another chemical mo a molecule, but this chemical reaction goes on by itself with, with the release of some energy. What energy is released? This amount of energy per mole. What is the mole? The amount of substance containing the Avogadro number of molecules. <coughs> so if you take the Avogadro mo number of molecules, so one mole of substance, uh, such energy will be released if one mole of ozone is turned into one is turned into oxygen. By the way, the number of moles will be of oxygen will be different. We'll, we will discuss it now. So we know this heat, uh, specific heat. Assume that the heat capacity of one gram molecule of oxygen at a constant volume is given, is known. The heat capacity of oxygen at a constant volume is 5 calories per mole Kelvin. Here we need Kelvin because this is a specific heat uh, capacity related to heating the substance and heating by some degrees of Kelvin, some Kelvins. So we need Kelvin here in the units of measurement. <coughs> so <coughs> what's happening here in this problem? <coughs> One molecule of ozone is dissociated by itself into the molecule of oxygen and an atom of oxygen. And then another molecule of ozone also dissociates into a molecule of oxygen and a free atom of oxygen. And these two atoms of oxygen combine to form a molecule of oxygen. So two molecules of ozone, two molecules, will produce three molecules of oxygen. And that may be written as two molecules of ozone will turn into three molecules of oxygen plus that amount of heat energy produced for each mole, each mole of ozone. So if we take a single mole of ozone, it will contain the Avogadro number of molecules. How many molecules will be here as a result? How many molecules of oxygen will be the result of this chemi chemical reaction? Well, if two molecules of ozone produce three molecules of oxygen, then the number of molecules here will be 50% larger. Uh, the number of molecules will be 1.5 time, times larger than the number of molecules here. If we have Avogadro number of molecules here of ozone, then here we will have 1.5 Avogadro number of molecules of oxygen. That is the number of molecules and the number of moles certainly will be uh, will be different if we take one mole of ozone we will obtain 1.5 moles of oxygen as a result in this reaction so in result of uh, as a result of this reaction we uh, we will obtain a different gas and a different number of moles of a uh, new gas of oxygen <coughs> 
So this reaction actually goes on very slowly if the temperature is low, for example, at room temperatures. This is a very slow process. But if the temperature is high, then this dissociation of ozone goes on uh, at a higher rate. Uh, and the higher the temperature, the higher the rate of this reaction. And you see the, r the temperature here of the ozone is very large. So it's 527 degrees Celsius. What about Kelvin? It's very hot gas, more than 500 degrees. So in Kelvin, this temperature will be equal to T1 plus 273 degrees uh, Kelvin. So that will be equal to, uh, if you add this number and this number, you will find it to be 800 kelvins. So that is the temperature, the absolute temperature of ozone. And that temperature is very high. And uh, at high temperatures, this reaction of um, dissociation of molecules of ozone, when one molecule uh, of ozone uh, loses one atom of oxygen. This reaction, when the molecule of ozone is uh, torn into parts, into two parts, one part is molecule of oxygen and another part is an atom of oxygen. So in order to, uh, in order to separate the two parts uh, from one another, we need some uh, temperature. We need temperature because uh, this uh, reaction goes when uh, goes on when two molecules of ozone collide at high velocity, at high energy, and that energy is enough to cause the molecule to, to break into two parts, the molecule of ozone, uh, to dissociate. We say the breaking of molecules under such conditions is called dissociation of a molecule. The molecule of ozone is dissociated into two parts, into molecule of oxygen and an atom of oxygen. And this process goes on at high temperature, if you, take, if, you, if you take the ozone at low temperature, then this reaction will go very slowly, very low rate. Uh, but at high temperature, it, it takes just uh, uh, relatively small time. Well, maybe an hour. I don't know. Maybe some minutes or some hours. But uh, the time is hmm, quite finite. It's quite reasonable, and we can observe this reaction and the results of this reaction. So we have in this problem a container or a vessel with heat impermeable walls, so, so that the heat energy is kept inside it. The walls are heat impermeable, so that the amount of heat energy inside is constant, and the change of heat energy, total change of heat energy, is zero. And Originally, there was ozone, and then, due to dissociation of molecules of ozone, we obtain uh, all this gas of ozone is turned into oxygen. So finally, we will have oxygen here. What, can, what do we know from physics in order to solve this problem? We know, certainly, the law of ideal gas, that is, Pressure times volume equals the number of moles, universal gas constant, and absolute temperature. Initially, when there was a zone here, that equation certainly uh, was true. It, uh, certainly, the gas obeyed this equation. But originally, there was some initial pressure and initial temperature and initial number of moles. But finally, when ozone turned into oxygen, pressure changed. The volume did not change. The volume of the vessel remained the same. The number of moles changed. Now it's new too. Universal gas constant remains the same because it's constant. And temperature also changes. Why temperature does change? Because why does this temperature change? Because some heat energy is released in this reaction. The reaction is called <coughs> uh, exothermal because the heat energy is released. So temperature will be different. The temperature of oxygen will be different. Well, what is important for us, we know 
beforehand, uh, the ratio between these two uh, numbers, this is the num number of moles which was originally in the container, and that is the final number of moles. So the number of moles will be that we know uh, if there is new one moles of ozone, then they will turn into uh, one into into the number of moles, which is 1.5 times larger. So it will turn into another number of moles equal to 1.5 times the original number of moles because of these coefficients. Why do we know that this is 1.5? Because two molecules of ozone turn into three molecules of oxygen. So the increase in the number of molecules will be 50%, and the same should be the increase in the number of moles. So we know the ratio between these two numbers. What else is known here? Uh, another thing which we can use and we must use, that is the energy balance equation. The energy balance here will be uh, written in, in this form. Uh, so if one mole of ozone turns into oxygen, then this amount of heat is released. But if new one moles of ozone turn into oxygen, then the amount of heat will be new one uh, times larger. The number of m moles should be here. That is the heat energy released by one mole. If we multiply it by the number of moles, we obtain the total heat energy released inside this container. Why this energy is released? Because of this reaction. Uh, exothermal reaction. Where does this energy go? It goes to heat the gas inside it, and the final gas will be oxygen. So this is this equation for is for ozone, and this equation is for final state of the gas, which is oxygen. So the final temperature will be larger than the initial temperature, obviously, because some heat energy is released inside, and this heat energy will go to uh, to warm up the gas. At first it will be a gas mixture, but finally it will be the single gas oxygen, uh, the final state of the gas. <coughs> so the heat uh, energy will go to heat the oxygen finally, and that will that's mean that we have to take the specific heat of oxygen under constant volume. The volume here is constant, we know about it, so the specific heat under constant volume of oxygen this is the molar specific heat in calories per mole, so we must multiply it by the number of moles of oxygen, which is nu2. And uh, also we must multiply it by the change in temperature, T1, or T2 final temperature minus initial temperature, T1. That is, we have three equations which describe the laws of physics which can be applied in this particular problem. And uh, from these three equations, everything must, be, uh, everything must be solvable. What do we need to know in this problem? We need to know what was the change in pressure. The problem says, what is the change in pressure inside the vessel? So how much the pressure is changed? By how many times? In order to find uh, how much pressure P2 is larger than the pressure P1, we must divide the second equation by the first equation. And we will obtain P2 divided by P1, because volume will cancel here. And then here we will have nu2 divided by nu1, the number of moles, uh, the number of moles of, ozo of ozone and oxygen. Universal gas constant will cancel, and also we will have temperature 2 divided by temperature 1, the final temperature divided by initial temperature. That is, if we divide the second equation by the first equation, we will immediately find the ratio of the pressures. That is what we need to find, how much pressure has changed here, how much pressure has changed, how much uh, P2, the pressure P2 is larger than P1. 
maybe three times larger, maybe five times larger, we don't know, maybe 25 times larger. But we have to find this ratio. <coughs> and in order to find it, it's convenient to divide the second equation by the first equation. In order to find this unknown quantity, we must find the ratio of temperatures. And this can be done using the last equation here. So uh, temperature T1 is actually given. This is 800 Kelvin. So we need to find temperature T2 from this equation. And T1 is known. If we find temperature, final temperature T2, then we could calculate this ratio. OK, let's do it. I just rewrite it. Temperature T2 must be, must be placed here in the denominator, and I want to, to find this temperature from this equation. I will, put, I will write it here that T2 will equal to nu 1q, nu 1q plus this term Cv nu 2 temperature 1 T1 divided by this term Cv nu 2 Cv nu 2 temperature 1. That is, we can simplify this equation. Oh, something's wrong here. Certainly, no temperature T1, it must be here. Nothing like that. Certainly. We divide only by this coefficient at, at the T2, Cv nu 2. Only this coefficient should be in denominator. So we can simplify it by dividing term by term, and that will be nu 2, div nu 1 divided by nu 2. That is here. Q divided by CV. And plus, that will cancel, and plus T1. That is. That is, we found that temperature, final temperature of oxygen will be larger than the initial temperature of ozone, and it will be larger by this amount, which is given by the first term here. So the uh, initial temperature of ozone should be added some quantity in order to find the final temperature in this vessel. So we have found T2. We may take this equation here. And we may divide it by nu, and we may uh -huh, divide it by t1. I have to divide by t1 this equation. I have to take this equation and divide it by t1. So I will put it this way. Nu1 divided by nu2, q over Cv, and temperature t1 here, plus T1 divided by T1 will give you just <coughs> unity. Now we have to calculate this equation, this formula. Everything is known. Everything, every quantity here is given in the problem statement. So by opening the round brackets, we obtain uh, all these coefficients nu will cancel in the first term, and we will obtain Q divided by Cv temperature 1 plus uh, plus nu 2 divided by nu 1. Q is given in this problem 34 kilo calories. 34 times 10 to the third power of calories per mole. Cv is given its 5 calories per mole Kelvin. And T1 is given. It's 800, 800. And plus the ratio of the moles, and the ratio of the moles is well known to us. Nu2 divided by nu1 is 3 over 2, 1.5. <coughs> 1 1.5 is 3 over 2. OK, it's, you can put it 1.5, no problem. So. 
So what is 5 times 800? In denominated, will be 4,000. And 4,000 times 8 will be 32,000. So only 2,000 remains here. So the first term will be equal to, well, thousands will cancel, thousands here and here will cancel. So we have to divide 30, 34 divided by 4. It will be 8.5 plus this term, which is 1.5. So 8.5 plus 1.5 is 10. That is the final answer to this problem. We, we found that the, last, that the final, temp, the final pressure is 10 times the initial pressure. Final pressure in the vessel will increase tenfold as compared to the initial pressure. Final pressure is larger, 10 times larger. <coughs> By the way, if you calculate the final temperature, it's possible, it's not a problem. Q is known, that is the Q. CV is known, that is 5. So Q divided by 5 is about 7, about 7,000. Uh, and that will be about uh, exactly 2 over 3. And if you 7,000 multiply by 2 over 3, then you get well, and plus 800, you will get about something approximately 5,000 kelvins. That is a huge temperature, 5,000 kelvins inside the vessel. So the oxygen, the final state of this gas will be oxygen, and the temperature, the final temperature, is found to be about 5,000 kelvins. I, I don't calculate it exactly, I just estimate by the order of magnitude, and estimation gives you, uh, it's not difficult, 34,000 divided by 5, that is about 5,000, and multiplied by 2 divided by 3, and plus 800. Yes, that is about 5,000. Very hot, 5,000 kelvins. That is almost the temperature on the surface of a sun, of our sun. Uh, this, the surface, the sun surface temperature is about 6,000 uh, kelvins, about 6,000, and here we find it about 5,000. So, uh, is there any wall, any material which will stand such high temperature and w which will not melt under such conditions? I don't know. Uh, frankly, frankly speaking, I don't know if there is such a material which will stand 5,000 Kelvin and a large pressure. I don't know. It seems to me that any material will finally melt and all this vessel will be broken. I, I'm, I guess so. I'm not sure there is such a material which will stand such a high temperature. <coughs> okay, that is the solution of this problem, problem 337. And in our solution, we used just uh, ideal gas equation and energy balance, heat energy balance. Nothing more. And that's enough to, to find the change in pressure and to find the final temperature in this situation. Next, we will consider problem number 369.
uh, three, six, nine. A calorimeter contains 400 grams of water. So we know the mass, 400 grams of water at a temperature of 5 degrees Celsius. So Celsius temperature may, may be denoted by small letter T. Sometimes in some literature sources you will find it. The temperature measured in, cells, in degrees of Celsius, uh, in Celsius degrees, is denoted by small t, while temperature measured in kelvins, in absolute, uh, de uh, in absolute temperature, is denoted by capital T. So the initial temperature of this water, 400 grams of water, is 5 degrees Celsius. So there is a vessel containing this amount of water, 400 grams, 400 grams of water at such temperature. Then mass M2, 200 grams, is added here. We add here mass M2, and mass M1 was here originally. Mass M2 is added 200 grams of water at a temperature T1 equal 10 degrees Celsius. 10 degrees Celsius. And also, a piece of ice is thrown here. The mass of ice is M3, and it's given the mass of ice M3 is added. Uh, 400 grams, such a piece of ice, almost half a kilogram, is added to this container. And the temperature of ice, the initial temperature, was minus 60 degrees Celsius. Minus 60 degrees uh, Celsius. What is the temperature in the calorimeter? Uh, well, such a container with adiabatic walls, I mean thick walls, which do not uh, allow for the heat energy to penetrate, <coughs> which is heat insulating. Uh, the heat insulating wall uh, will give you a vessel which is called a calorimeter. A calorimeter well, is uh, uh, very often, this device is very often used in laboratories because uh, the amount of heat energy inside is constant. Heat energy is not transferred through the walls. And therefore, we can use the energy balance equation to solve complicated problems and to find the final temperature in such a process, which is described here when you have initially some amount of water, this amount of water at initial temperature, and then another amount of water is poured into this container at a different temperature, and then some ice, a piece of ice, of 400 grams of ice is, uh, is put into this container at the initial temperature, minus 60 degrees. <coughs> so we will have a few minutes break now.
So we consider a process of mixing of two portions of water at different temperatures in the calorimeter, calorimeter and uh, then some piece of ice at very low temperature, minus 60 degrees Celsius, uh, some piece of ice is added here. It's obvious that the ice will be heated and the temperature of ice will be increased at the ex expense of decreasing the temperature of water because the final temperature of water will not be very large. It will be just uh, some degrees above Celsius, Celsius, between 5 and 10 degrees, well, probably 7 or 8 uh, degrees Celsius. So the temperature of water will be decreased and the expense of releasing some heat energy from water, the ice, the piece of ice will uh, increase its temperature. But what will be the final result of this process? We don't know. We don't know beforehand. And we have to assess the amount of energy released by water and the amount of energy needed to heat up the ice. So we need to just to make assessment of the amounts of heat involved. Let us first uh, calculate the amount of heat released by water. So we have the total uh, amount of water. The amount of water, original amount of mass M, will have heat energy uh, if, if, if all this water cools down to 0 degrees centigrade. Well, I guess that that the water will cool down to 0 degrees because the ice is, is very cold and uh, the mass of the ice is large, 400 grams compared, well, comparable to the mass of water. So uh, I, I guess that the water, all the water here in the container will cool down to zero degrees centigrade. And I want to calculate the amount of heat energy released in this process. So the heat energy released by water will be given by the specific heat of water, M1, and temperature of water, T1. I should use T1 minus 0, but that is the difference, uh, the temperature difference. But T1 minus 0 makes no sense. So I put it like T1 times the mass of the first portion, M1, and uh, the specific heat of water, and also another portion of water, uh, the same specific heat and the mass M2, and it will cool down from the initial temperature T2. So this amount of energy, of heat energy, will be released by the water, which will cool down to zero degrees centi Celsius. Uh, so the first mass of water will cool down from starting from 5 and will it, it stores the first um, portion of water 400 grams um, has this amount of heat energy above 0 degrees and this and the second portion of water has this amount of heat energy above 0 degrees uh, Celsius so we just can calculate it uh, specific heat for water is one calorie per mole one calorie per gram and so this is M1, 400 grams, and T1 is 5. Plus, again, that is 1 calorie per gram. M2 is 200 grams times 10 degrees. And that will give us 2,000 here and 2,000 here. That will be 4,000 calories. 4,000 calories, such a, an amount of heat energy will be released in this process when water, and only water, cools down to zero degrees uh, Celsius. So if we take this amount of heat energy released by water and uh, give this heat energy amount to the piece of ice, then what will be the final temperature of ice. It's obvious that the ice 
will, will be heated to some higher temperature, and we need to calculate this higher temperature. OK? So heat energy balance will look something like that. The heat energy released by water, that is for 4,000 calories, will go to heat the ice, to increase the temperature of ice. That will be the specific heat of ice times the mass of ice and times the temperature difference. Well, I can simply put it like delta T. And I need to find the final temperature, the fin the, this temperature difference. From here, the temperature difference, that is by how many degrees will the ice, the piece of ice, uh, will, will, will be heated, uh, will, will be heated by how many degrees delta T will be equal to delta Q1 divided by heat capacity, specific heat of ice, mass of ice. So delta Q1 is 4,000 calories. And the specific heat of ice is 0 0.5 calorie per gram. And the mass of ice is 400 grams. Well, you can find this quantity in the table of physical, uh, uh, of physical constants. The specific heats of different substances is well known. It's, it's been measured in laboratories. Uh, to high degree of accuracy, and you can find all this. This is an approximate uh, figure, but it's found in the tables of physical constants uh, for different substances. So that will give us what? Uh, 400 times 0 0.5 is 200, and uh, 4,000 divided by 200, that will be 20. 20 degrees. That is the temperature difference for the piece of ice. The initial temperature was minus 60. And uh, this piece of ice will be heated by 20 degrees. So the final temperature of ice will be minus 40 degrees Celsius. It was minus 60. It will be heated. It will be heated up by 20 degrees. We have calculated uh, this amount of heat energy. So the final temperature of ice will be minus 40 degrees. That is if all the water is cooled down to 0 degrees. That was the condition. That is what I calculated here. The water is cooled down to 0 degrees, and the temperature of ice increases from minus 60 to minus 40. So at this stage, the ice, the piece of ice at minus 40 degrees temperature will be in contact with the water, which is uh, at zero degrees. What will happen in these conditions? Certainly, the water will freeze into ice, and the freezing of water will, in, in the freezing of water in this process, some heat will be released, because when water freezes, it releases heat. And when you need to melt ice, you need to supply this piece of ice with some heat energy. You need to supply energy in order to, to melt the ice. So this, this is called the specific heat of melting. The specific heat of melting, ice melting specific heat. In order to melt, one gram of ice, you need to convey about 80 calories per one gram of ice, about 80 calories. That is the exact figure, 79 point something, but I take it uh, as rounded up in order to uh, simplify the calculations. So that is, again, the physical constant of substance. And you can find a lot of such 
constant in the tables, uh, physics constants of physics parameters of different uh, materials. So in order to melt one gram of ice, you need to supply this piece of ice with 80 calories of heat energy. That is the specific heat of melting. And the same amount of energy, heat energy, will be released if water is turned into ice at zero degrees. If water is freezing to form the ice, then each gram of freezed water will produce the same amount of heat energy which is needed to melt one gram of ice into water. So when you melt ice into water, you must supply heat energy to the ice. And when water is, uh, is freezing, uh, it's releasing energy, the same amount of energy uh, to the uh, surrounding bodies. So we may calculate how much water will, will be frozen if the temperature of ice will increase up to zero up to zero degrees. So the ice is heating, its temperature is increasing, while the water in this container is frozen, is freezing. So the water is freezing and the ice is uh, increasing its temperature. So the ice gives up some uh, heat energy. Uh, the ice releases, absorbs heat energy in order to increase its temperature. The ice absorbs energy released by the water freezing into ice. So we need to calculate how much water will be frozen into ice. So we take, we don't know how much water will be frozen. So this is unknown quantity. So this is some unknown quantity mx, the mass of water frozen. Uh, if one gram of water is frozen, then this amount of heat energy is released. I don't know how much water is frozen, how many grams, but if I denote this unknown quantity of grams of water frozen, then this amount of heat will be released. And this amount of heat will be absorbed by ice, and the ice will increase its temperature. So we take this specific heat of ice when it's heated times the mass of the ice, which is M3, times the temperature difference we know, we, we suppose that all the ice will be heated from minus 40 degrees Celsius up to zero degrees. So we know this temperature difference. This is 40 degrees Celsius. We know this. This is delta T for ice. This is the change of temperature of ice starting from minus 40 degrees up to uh, zero degrees. So the ice will be heated up to zero degrees and uh, this will require some energy in order to heat the ice, in order to increase its temperature. It will require some heat energy. Where do we take this heat energy? It will be taken from frozen water. Some amount of water, Mx, will be frozen. And each gram of water will release this amount of heat energy. So from here, we can calculate the unknown amount of water that will be frozen in this process. And that will be given by Ci m3 times 40 degrees divided by q. And by substituting numerical values into this formula, we obtain the specific heat of ice is, uh, is what? It's 0 0.5 calories per gram. And the number of grams in the ice is 400. So the mass m3 is 400 grams times 40 degrees divided by Q80 calories per gram. 80 calories per gram. Uh, 80, yeah, 80 calories per gram. <coughs> uh, so this the units of measurement of this quantity is calories per gram uh, Kelvin. Kelvin will, uh, the, gr uh, the degree will, uh, th these Kelvins will be, degrees will cancel with this uh, 
units of measurement of temperature. And what remains here? Calories per gram, and here also calories per grams. So all calories and grams here will be cancelled, and the only unit of measurement remaining here will be grams for M3. And that will give us some grams of water, the unknown quantity of water. So I just calculate the numbers, and I don't care about the units of measurement, but in order to omit the units of measurement in your calculations, you must always perform this uh, assessment. You must conduct, uh, you must check whether the units of measurement will cancel and whether the formula will give you the units of measurement you need. You must always do this procedure in order to not to make a mistake. So what happens here, we may cancel uh, one thing and then what else is here? Four, 40 times 0 0.5 that will give you 20 uh, uh, 40 divided by 8 will give you 5 and that will give you 20 times 5 100, 100 of what? That is the mass of water in grams certainly. So 100 grams of water here 100 grams of water will be frozen out of 600 total amount of water, total mass of water. The total amount is M1 plus M2. 600 grams. Out of 600 grams of water, 100 grams will be frozen. And the heat released in this freezing will be just enough to increase the temperature of the piece of ice from minus 40 degrees up to zero degrees. So the piece of ice will be heated up to zero degrees and uh, while 100 grams of water will be frozen. So the total amount of ice here, finally, the total amount of ice will be original 400 grams plus another 100. That is 500 grams of ice, including the, uh, the initial piece of ice of 400 grams and the additional 100 grams of ice uh, which was formed here due to water freezing. 100 grams of water will turn into ice additionally. So the final amount of ice will be 500 grams. And uh, out of 600 grams of water, 100 grams will be lost because it will go into ice here. So the final mass of water, final mass of water, will be also 500 grams. So finally here, finally the temperature here, the final temperature will be zero degrees Celsius. And in this container, in this calorimeter, we will have half a kilogram of ice and half a kilogram of water, the mixture of ice and water at zero degrees Celsius. That is the solution of this problem. Note that we were unable to obtain this solution immediately using some single formula. In, in such a complicated case when we had initial amount of water at one temperature and another amount of water poured here at another temperature and a piece of ice added here at very low temperature, we were unable to, to conclude what will be the final state of substance here. Whether all, this, whether all the ice would melt into water and finally we will find only water here without any ice or whether all the water here contained will fr will be frozen into ice and the only thing we found here uh, finally will be the piece of ice and no water at all we we, we didn't know uh, from the very beginning we had no idea about it and in order to conclude what will be the final state we we must carry out some assessments. We, we must figure out what, what happens. We must assess the amount of heat if water cools down to zero degrees. And then we understand that if water cools down, then the ice will be heated. At what temperature? At what, what will be the temperature of ice heating? We found that by 20 degrees, the ice will be heated only by 20 degrees if all the water is cooled down to zero degrees. So we might, must make these assessments before we use the final formula, uh, and we must un first we must understand what should be the final state, the final state of matter here, whether it should be a mixture of ice and, and water at zero 
degrees Celsius, or it may be some piece of ice at some minus 5 or minus 10 degrees, or it, it should be uh, all water, all ice melted into water at some positive degree, at some positive temperature. So it was unclear. Originally, we did not know. And in order to solve the problem, we had to make some assessment. Assessment, how much energy is released and how much energy is absorbed in this process and how much energy is released in another process and what will happen finally. We must make this assessment in order to come to final conclusion that the uh, final temperature will be zero degrees and the final state will be mixture of half a kilogram of water and half a kilogram of ice inside this calorie meter. <coughs> that is problem number uh, 369. Uh -huh. There is another good problem, 371. I will consider another <coughs> interesting problem. Again, with water and ice. Problem 371. It says, when a small ice crystal is placed into overcooled water, it begins to freeze instantaneously. It, the water, <laughs> the water begins to freeze instantaneously. <coughs> well, sometimes I don't like the language of this, of this booklet with collection of problems. But anyway, it's clear what, what do they mean. What amount of ice is formed? from one kilogram of water. So we are given the amount of water, that is one kilogram. And uh, the water is overcooled down to temperature minus eight degrees Celsius. So what amount of ice is formed from one kilogram of water placed in calorimeter which is at minus eight degrees Celsius. What is the overcooled water? <coughs> so we, we believe that if we cool down some water to zero degrees Celsius, then if we try to cool down again further uh, this cold water, then it will freeze. Not always. If the water is absolutely pure, if there are no impurities, no additional uh, particles of dust, for example, then there will be no centers of crystallization, we say, uh, because the ice is formed at some particular points which are centers of crystallization or the crystallization nucleus. If there are no such centers of crystallization, if water is absolutely pure, then it will not freeze. It may be cooled down below zero degrees, below zero degree Celsius. But in this condition, water will be in an unstable si situation, unstable state of, that is an unstable state of water. What does it mean that it's unstable? It means that if you add some impurity into this water, some small crystal of ice or some other particle, small particle of dust or small particle of sand, something like that at low temperature, then the water will freeze very quickly around this small nucleus of crystallization, about the center of crystallization. So we add to this water, there is a container with water, one kilogram of water is here, and the temperature is minus eight degrees Celsius. So the water is overcooled. It means that it's pure, a distilled water without any 
uh, particles in it without any centers of crystallization. And there were therefore no crystallization occurs, no, no freezing. But if we add a small piece of ice, a very small piece of ice is added here, then the water starts crystallizing, that is freezing quickly around this center of crystallization. And we need to find what will be uh, the mass of this ice, the unknown mass. I will denote it by m, small, small letter m. If the initial mass of water was capital M, one, one kilogram. So what happens here, actually, when, when water is freezing, Uh, it will release some heat energy. Because in order to melt the ice, you need to convey some heat energy to this piece of ice in order to, make it m in order to melt it into water. So when we have a, an opposite process, when water is freezing into ice, uh, some heat energy is released. So heat energy is released. And this heat energy naturally goes to heat the water to increase its temperature. So while the water is freezing around the nucle nucleus of crystallization, the temperature of surrounding water is increased. And the process will go on until the temperature of water will be zero degrees Celsius. So the water will be heated from the initial temperature minus eight up to zero degrees Celsius. Where does the water take heat energy to be heated up? It will take the heat energy from this piece of ice which was forming, which was formed here, and while the ice is formed, the heat energy is released. So if one gram of ice is formed, then this specific heat of melting will be released. If m grams of ice are formed here, then such a heat energy will be released. And this he heat energy will go to, to increase the temperature of the surrounding water, finally up to zero degrees. So I will have the mass of water heated up, which will be the initial mass of water minus the mass of ice, multiplied by the specific heat of water and uh, multiplied by the temperature difference, which is certainly uh, this amount, my eight degrees, because the initial temperature minus eight, and the final temperature will be zero. So final temperature minus initial temperature, zero minus minus eight will give you plus eight. So that will be the change in temperature of water. That is the delta T. Uh, that will be plus eight. The change of temperature will be plus eight, because the initial temperature was minus eight and we heat the water up to zero degrees. So that amount of heat is needed to increase the temperature of water from minus eight degrees up to zero degrees. But also, not only the water will be heated, but also this piece of ice will be heated. And its final temperature must be also zero degrees, because, the, because if the temperature of ice is below zero degrees, then uh, it, may, it may be heated up to zero while some water will, will, be, will be freezing mm, due to this uh, heating, due to this freezing of. Mm. So, so uh, the piece of ice should also be heated. Therefore, we must add here the heating of piece of ice having uh, the specific heat of ice and the same temperature difference, the same I increase in temperature. So both the ice will be heated up to zero degrees and water will be heated up to zero degrees due to the heat energy released in uh, the formation of ice during the formation of m grams of ice here. So m grams of ice formed in this process, and this amount of heat energy released, and this amount of heat energy goes to heat the water 
up to zero degrees and to heat the piece of ice also. And from this equation, we must find the unknown quantity, which is the mass of ice. And I will put it in this way, QAM plus AMC delta C, MC delta T. So this is C of uh, specific heat of water, and this is specific heat of ice. These are different quantities. So this is specific heat of water. And uh, minus AM specific heat of ice delta T. And all this will be equal to capital AM specific heat of water delta T. And from here we find that the mass unknown quantity will be equal to capital AM specific heat of water delta T divided by Q plus specific heat of water delta T minus specific heat of ice delta T. Now we can calculate the mass of the ice. We can calculate the mass of the ice, the resulting mass of the ice formed in this process. It can also be, it can also, uh, it can be only less than the initial amount of water because uh, only this amount of water may turn into ice. So the maximum, maximum mass of the ice must be M, no, no larger than capital M. Actually, the mass of the ice must be less than the initial mass of water. We know that beforehand. And uh, so we must substitute here all the quantities given in this problem, and that will be AM, one kilogram. So if it's one kilogram, then it will be 1,000 grams. I need to take it like 1,000 grams, because all the specific heats here are given in calories per gram. So I must use the mass in grams. And specific heat of water is one calorie per gram, and delta T is 8. And here we have Q, uh, specific heat of water melting, which is 80 calories per grams, calories per gram, plus specific heat of water is 1 times delta T8 minus specific heat of ice is 0 0.5, and the same temperature difference, 8 degrees. Well, it's not difficult to calculate it. This will give you 8 times 0 0.5. That will be 4. 8 minus 4 will be 4. And 80 plus 4 will be 84. So the denominator is 84. And the nominator is 8 times 1,000. That is 8,000. Well, roughly speaking, it's 100 grams. But actually, we divide not by 80, but by a number slightly larger than 80. So the amount will be slightly smaller than 100 grams. I believe it will be something like, well, probably 95 grams, approximately. I, I like approximate calculations because there is no sense in carrying out uh, exact calculations because in any problems all the numbers taken here are approximate. This, this is approximate. We have already rounded it uh, to up to 80 and all other sea ice are is approximate number. So <coughs> approximate value. So if you have some approximate quantities here there is no need to calculate exactly because there is always some discrepancy so always also you have some you always have mm, already have some <coughs> uh, divergence from the exact number so no reason in calculating no sense in calculating the exact numbers you must al always you must just assess 
what you obtain, roughly 100 grams, but a, li a little bit smaller, something like about 95 grams of water will turn into ice. So about 95 grams, less than 10% of water will turn into ice. So if you take overcooled water, pure water, overcooled at temperature minus 8 degrees Celsius, and throw a small piece of ice, a very small piece of ice, just one uh, t tiny, tiny piece, tiny sand, sand uh, of ice, uh, tiny particle of ice. Then the process of uh, water freezing will be uh, instantaneous. Water will freeze very quickly, and the freezing will continue until the temperature here becomes zero degrees centigrade because the ice cannot can no longer be created by itself above zero degrees uh, Celsius. So we use the energy balance equation, how much heat will, will be released by uh, freezing water if m grams of water freeze to form some piece of ice here, how much heat is released? And this heat will go to heat the water and heat the ice up to zero degrees from the initial minus eight. So that's it, the energy balance equation. And that is the solution of this problem. Less than 10% of the initial water mass will be frozen into ice here in this process. <coughs> that's it. That's the solution and discussion of this problem. Well, I'm afraid we have little time remaining until the end of this lecture. <coughs> so about four minutes, about four minutes remaining. And I would like to discuss, use these four minutes not to solve another problem. <coughs> we will have no time to solve another problem. But I will discuss a simple but important pro process, important thing like uh, heat energy transfer. If you have some heated body, a heated object here at high temperature, T1, and some other object here at lower temperature, T2, which is lower than T1, then the heated object will somehow transfer heat energy to the uh, cold object. The warm object will somehow transfer heat energy in this direction. That is the Experimental fact, heat energy always flows from heat, from heated body to a, a cold body. Uh, there are several different ways to transfer heat energy. First, by thermal convection, uh, by simply by convection. By convection, that is when some uh, gas or liquid flows, heated liquid or heated gas flows, and by convection the heat energy is transferred. Then there is another process of radiation. The heat energy may be transferred by radiation. Radiation. That is the way the heat energy from our sun comes to the earth, by radiation. And another process is heat conductivity heat conductivity. Uh, heat conductivity is when two bodies in, are in contact and the heat is transferred from one body, from warm, warm body to cold body through heat conductivity. So as far as heat conductivity is concerned, I would like to, uh, I would like to show you one simple formula which is responsible for heat conductivity or which describes the heat conductivity. So if you have some object and the heat is transferred through this object, just one minute more. So the amount of heat transferred, the amount of heat transferred in unit time will be proportional to the area, to the area, because the larger the area, the, the larger the heat flow. And also it will be proportional to the temperature difference, that is uh, temperature 1 and that is temperature 2. If temperature 1 is larger than temperature 2, then the temperature difference 
must be here the heat transfer heat energy transferred will be proportional to temperature difference if temperature difference is zero if temperatures are the same here and here then there will be no heat transferred at all the heat transfer will be zero and also it will be uh, inversely proportional to the thickness of this uh, wall the thickness of this wall will be here and also there will be some constant which is particular for every material which is a heat conductivity of a um, substance and which is which describes the conductivity of heat properties of any material so this formula will be used in some of the problems in your home assignment that is as simple as that on this point <coughs> let us finish this lecture